Hello everyone! A while back, I finally ended up completing Bayonetta 2. This was the game that completely sold me on the series. I wasn't a huge fan of the first game, even though I still enjoyed it, and for some reason I just couldn't get into 3. But when I heard that an Origins game for Bayonetta was coming out, I was initially pretty intrigued. I might have forgotten about it for a few months, being as this game was practically shadow dropped on the eShop with literally no announcement as far as I can remember. But when I eventually came round to trying the demo a couple of weeks ago, I was genuinely really interested, and honestly, pretty surprised at how fun it was. The demo left me genuinely really interested in where the story was going to go, so I eventually bought the game, and I can safely say this is easily my favourite Bayonetta game behind Bayonetta 2. Not that there's much competition there, but still. Oh, and before I go any further, this video will be spoiling a few things about the game's story, though for the purposes of anyone who wants to play this game still, I'll try to be as vague as possible. The story of the game is shockingly pretty simple. Bayonetta ends up exiled from her village and begins training as an Umbra Witch in order to rescue her mother. Eventually, she winds up in Avalon Forest and summons a demon who somehow possesses her stuffed cat toy, it's never really explained, and the two have to work together in order to escape. Right off the bat, I adore the art style of this game. I love how the characters are drawn in this style, and the way the story is told through flipping pages in a storybook adds this weird element of charm to the game. I wasn't initially a huge fan of it, but it grew on me the more I played it. I love how no matter what's happening, the game feels like it's quite literally telling a story to you. Almost as if Bayonetta herself is reading a book of memories and looking back at her younger self. The game also does a perfect job of setting everything up. The demo contains the first few chapters of the game, and in contrast to the rest of the story, they're actually really slow. Though, don't get me wrong, I don't mean that in a bad way. I love the setup the first chapter gives you. It's a great way to teach the player organically how everything works and how Sarah's abilities will play into both the puzzles and the combat later into the game. And then when things slowly begin to pick up after Cheshire enters the picture, it naturally incorporates everything previously shown into every nook and cranny of the main aspects of traversing through the forest. Also, Cheshire is the single best thing to come out of this franchise. I don't care what anyone says, Cheshire is a goddamn treasure and I love him so much. The duality of Cheshire and Seriza is also honestly really well done. I love their dynamic and how well they play off each other. Going from Cheshire reluctantly helping Seriza because it's his only way to get home, to the two eventually becoming legitimately good friends. And what's great about it is that it isn't one-sided either. Seriza is genuinely pretty jaded towards Cheshire at the start of the game, and Cheshire would have absolutely devoured her if he was actually able to harm her. But you slowly see the two grow and begin to care for each other. Also, they have one of the best friendship breakups I've seen done in a game in, well, ever really, with them both feeling like they're the most important aspect of the duo, and thinking that the other one is completely useless in Cheshire's case, or just outright reckless and thick skulled in the case of Sarazer, only to have them both realise that they can't even begin to navigate the forest without the other. Sarazer has no way to protect herself against any of the enemies, and Cheshire being exactly as reckless as Sarazer said is immediately captured. There never once was a point in the story where I felt like the two were just going to have some stupid pointless argument that meant nothing. They needed to split up to see how much they needed each other. And because they both ended up seeing how completely fucked they were without the other, it helped them actually build a better bond than they had before. Normally, I cannot stand this trope in any form of media, but this game has it tied so well to both characters' personalities that honestly, even though I knew it was probably going to happen at some point, it still caught me off guard at how well it was done. Plus, it leads to arguably one of the most interesting areas in the game too, so I can't complain about it. One thing I was initially kind of worried about was having to control Seriza and Cheshire simultaneously. And yeah, okay, it can be kind of annoying, especially if you're like me and end up focusing on one character only to completely lose track of the other. Especially with how small Seriza is, I pretty much always had my eyes focused on where she was on the screen, and due to my really bad hand-eye coordination, it made moving both characters really hard at times. Though you are able to just have Cheshire go into hug mode, yes, that's actually what it's called, and yes, this is the cutest thing I've ever seen, and then you only have to control Seriza, so it's really not that big a deal. There are times where you'll need to move them separately, but there isn't much moving around done at those points, and even when there is, it's either moving one at a time or just the tiniest amount of repositioning. Plus, as the game went on, my brain kind of ended up hardwiring itself to control both characters at once, and it ended up being a lot of fun doing so. Most of the puzzles also involve you splitting up the characters, which I kind of found funny because the most inconsistent thing about this game is how far Cheshire can get away from Seriza. During gameplay, and even really early on in the story, it's said that if Cheshire gets too far away, you just outright collapse. 
Though during puzzles as well as that one section where they split up that I just mentioned, he's completely fine for some reason. It's not a major issue, it's just something that I thought was funny. Regardless, the puzzles the game presents you with are less actually challenging and more so about working together with both characters in order to figure out the solutions. Most of, if not all, the puzzles are actually pretty simple but I appreciate how they use that simplicity to their advantage. Taking some simple mechanics or addition to the game and then putting an ever so slightly noticeable twist on it to make it something unique. It's a really clever way to make these parts of the game more involved. Not a single puzzle in the game feels stale. Even when you have to accomplish the same task over and over again, there's still always some kind of new twist to make it interesting. It never got to a point where I couldn't figure out what to do as most of the puzzles come down to doing a certain thing in a specific order, rather than having to overclock your brain trying to think of the solution. And as someone who is massively addicted to games like Ace Attorney, where overclocking your brain is literally the point of solving all of the puzzles, this was a genuinely nice change of pace. It might be weird to say it, but this game honestly has some of the most relaxing gameplay in between shredding fairies to pieces. It feels like a really cozy adventure despite what's actually happening. And speaking of shredding fairies to pieces, the combat is surprisingly well fleshed out, with Sarazza and Cheshire working as a team throughout most of the game to make the combat as enjoyable as possible. The different enemy types all have specific weaknesses or abilities tied to one of Cheshire's story upgrades. Much like the puzzles, this always manages to make combat fresh and interesting. Some enemies with specific weaknesses are introduced even before you have access to the specific ability that counters them. This isn't the case all the time, but when one is introduced this way, like the shield enemies for example, you have to come up with interesting methods of beating them before getting the upgrade that counters whatever their special factor is. And it's done so well that even after getting the ability to counter certain enemies' special properties, I was still using the more involved ways that the game was teaching me in order to deal with them. Despite Seraza being borderline useless the more the game goes on, if you're like me and tend to just barrel through everything with the strongest attacks you have, it is still incredibly fun to play strategically. Using both characters in tandem with one another makes the combat so much more enjoyable. And even if you don't really need to use Seraza once you unlock the third or honestly second ability for Cheshire, it's still a lot of fun to use her abilities to make combat less hectic and also just generally allows you to strategize more. Allowing you to deal with either the stronger enemies first and use Serraza as bait, or tying up the stronger enemies and taking the peons out with Cheshire. The simple abilities lend themselves to a ton of different playstyles and it's genuinely a lot of fun figuring out what works best. The combat is also pretty well spaced out as well. Just when you get to the point of wanting to get back into the combat, there will be a few enemies waiting for you around the corner. And on top of this, Cheshire's abilities that he gets access to throughout the course of the game are all used in incredibly creative ways. Not just in combat, but against the bosses as well. Each boss will have some kind of weakness to a new ability that you recently acquired, and you have to find out how to use that ability in order to exploit it. And even with these weaknesses, these bosses are some of the best I've fought in a long time, specifically the circus and dragon boss fights with the circus one being significantly funnier than I expected it to be. Having to knock this giant ass clown off a balance ball and then cause his own bombs to blow himself up, only for him to get stuck inside of the cannon at the end. And having Cheshire and Sarasa continuously stomp on the button to make the bombs explode in his face was so goddamn funny to me. I genuinely needed to take a minute to breathe after this fight was over. And the dragon boss fight was incredible. I won't go into too much detail on this one, specifically because outside of the final two bosses, which in reality is just one huge boss fight strung together by a genuinely really fun chase sequence, it's probably the best one in the entire game, with it being shown as an undefeatable presence the first time you encounter it, along with you then having to avoid it for the rest of the chapter before you're finally able to take it on again. And that's not to put the other bosses down either. Every single one is incredibly well integrated into the story, with them being tied to either some new ability you just awakened to or linked thematically to the area you're currently in. And speaking of the areas, they're all incredibly well defined. You'd think that this game taking place in a forest wouldn't leave much room for creativity now, would you? Well, as a matter of fact, not only is each area significantly different to the previous one, but every single area is so well defined that I can remember exactly what kind of puzzles show up there, with each one introducing some kind of new aspect, and putting its own twist on the old ones to keep everything fresh. And what's even more interesting about these areas is that the game kind of plays like a Metroidvania. Not in the traditional sense of something like Shantae or Metroid of course, but in the fact that you'll be returning pretty often to areas you previously explored, and you'll be able to use new abilities in order to advance to areas you initially thought you couldn't get to. 
I always like when games do stuff like this, including paths to new areas that you'll eventually be able to circle back to. It's a lot of fun seeing the potential ways the upgrades can help you navigate to new areas. I also want to quickly mention my extremely bad habit for jokingly calling twisting games and then somehow being right about them. It's happened in so many games now that I can no longer call it a coincidence, but Bayonetta Origins actually managed to outplay me in this department. I might have called one of the twists that the game was presenting, but I in no way called the second one. This was the first time a game has caught me off guard with a twist in a very long time. Again, for the purposes of keeping this as vague as possible so as to not spoil anything, none of the footage you're currently seeing right now is related to either of these twists. But the fact that they both come at you one after another is also really, really well foreshadowed if you pay attention to some of the collectibles you can snag during the game. On a replay, it doesn't quite come as out of left field as I initially thought, even though I never expected it. Once everything was explained, it was a genuinely really good twist though, and it led to an amazing final boss fight. What's even more shocking to me though was that there's actually a pretty decently lengthy post-game added to the experience. Playing as Jean instead of Bayo this time made the experience a lot more fun, especially being as not only does this game mode incorporate new bosses and puzzles, it also forces you to use new strategies thanks to Jean's playstyle. This game mode compared to the main story is genuinely really fucking difficult. Once you get the hang of things, it's a different story, but honestly, I kind of prefer this to how the main story was. Being as you have a few new options for crowd control thanks to Gian just being a more powerful witch than Bayo is at this point, but also there's a fair few drawbacks to it too. It makes combat so much more engaging than anything in the main game. I won't touch on this mode too much because honestly with everything thrown into what I initially thought was just going to be this small side story as a bonus for completing the game, you really need to experience it for yourself. I never expected to enjoy this game nearly as much as I did. I was fully prepared to think the game was perfectly fine and just have a few cute moments here and there, but this is easily the most fun I've had with a Bayo game since Bayonetta 2. If you're a fan of the series, you should absolutely pick this up. With all that said, if you enjoyed this one, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, join the Discord server, all that cool stuff, and until next time, stay safe everyone, peace.